Hello, students. Welcome to our next installment of a lecture. You've had a little bit of break, which is good, getting you excited and energized to connect with our next lecture. We are in our Vietnam unit, so we're connecting about this proxy war. Again, we are within the sort of the confines of the Cold War. We're fighting sort of this larger battle, but we're not actually fighting it against the Soviet Union, uh, but we are fighting sort of the spread of communism abroad. Uh, following the Truman Doctrine, which other presidents are going to do, both Republicans and Democrats throughout the world, including in Vietnam. And Vietnam is very similar to what takes place in the Korean War, uh, maybe in terms of the setup and kind of the background, very different in minor details, of course, uh, but the outcome is going to be tremendously different in terms of the Korean War versus the Vietnam War. In the Korean War, we saw you know, a victory for South Korea, maybe for the United Nations, for American involvement, you know, at the cost of American lives and, and uh, Korean lives as well, and financial cost, of course. Um, but we're largely going to see the spread of communism stop. Now, the outcome of the Vietnam War is going to be different in that we weren't able to stop the spread of communism. And there's going to be a couple of things that are different in a couple of scenarios that changes uh, in the Vietnam conflict to ultimately bring about that changed outcome. And uh, so America looks back and it's like we took a L, we took a loss uh, in the Vietnam conflict because ultimately communists in North Vietnam did end up spreading in the South Vietnam and unifying that country under communism, which is still the uh, government to system to this day. Now they've absorbed other sort of democratic capitalistic principles, but, and for the most part, since the early 1990s, uh, we have maintained a good relationship with Vietnam, and, and uh, even though they are a communist government. So we'll kind of talk about that as we get to the end of the lecture. Uh, I just want to preface that as we start the Vietnam lecture, that you probably have people in your family um, that served in Vietnam or, or remember that experience well, and probably your grandparents were alive. Uh, during that time period that I think they'd have to be alive during that time period. So if they're still around, please connect with them. What was it like to be alive during the 60s and early 1970s as the Vietnam War raged on? It's going to be a sort of a watershed moment for American politics, our economics and society uh, in terms of sort of the protests that are going to happen for and against the war. Um, and really this counterculture that rises up within the United States and really changes uh, a lot of the values and the value systems for America, not just in terms of this war, uh, but for uh, our American history and legacy from then on. So I hope you uh, are ready to take some notes and engage. A uh, very interesting time period and uh, always ask questions if you have those as well. But your best resources besides me and what I'm teaching you is going to be your grandparents. Just go try to connect with them. Ask them about this time period. I'm sure they would love to hear from you, especially to glean some wisdom from them. So here's uh, just three pictures of the Vietnam War. We have introduction of new technology, uh, which advances since the Korean War. We still have jet fighters, which really are popular, popularized in the Korean War, now showing up all over the place in the Vietnam conflict, but also the helicopter, which is uh, basically kind of invented in World War II, not used extensively there or in the Korean War, uh, but it is used pretty extensively in the jungles of Vietnam. And so you see a lot of this uh, Huey helicopter uh, sort of transporting troops and materials and rescuing uh, uh, prisoners of war, rescuing uh, those uh, soldiers that have been wounded and died in combat as well. And so what you see is are pictures like this is going to be a pretty... Um, uh, sort of a diverse uh, group of servicemen. Again, uh, it's like the Korean War in which our armed services are going to be desegregated, but we start to see uh, a lot more diversity in our military and those that serve in the Vietnam conflict. Uh, in terms of racial compos composition, we're going to see more women as nurses, as we have in previous American conflicts, contributing greatly in that regard. Uh, but what's kind of different about this war from World War II or even the Korean War is there is going to be a draft, but there's going to be more people that sort of object to the draft or find ways to avoid being drafted in the Vietnam conflict. So ma the majority of soldiers are going to be lower class from the working class societies of America, and that's 
also what's going to make it so diverse uh, racially, uh, but not necessarily economically, because many of the middle class Americans are going to sort of find a way uh, to not fight as well as, uh, as always, kind of in American history, the upper class uh, are not going to be fighting this war. So, uh, but just to remember sort of the consequences of the Vietnam War, uh, very powerful uh, Vietnam War Memorial that's in Washington, D.C. This is one side of two sides that literally descends down into the ground with the names of those that perish in the Vietnam War uh, written and inscribed in marble uh, at this Vietnam Memorial. And people still go and write tributes to uh, family, friends, loved ones. Uh, very powerful memorial in Washington, D.C. if you've ever been there. Um, very simple, but yet uh, very uh, powerful uh, in its simplicity. All right, so let's get right into lecture then. So Vietnam, you know, this is kind of the beginnings or the background lecture. Uh, what's going on in Vietnam and why is America going to get involved there? Uh, so Vietnam is originally part of the Chinese Empire historically um, in, until it's colonized by the French. Uh, before World War II, it's going to be a colony of the French uh, from the 1700s, 1800s um, until after World War II. And there's going to be an issue World War II. Uh, if you remember, France got invaded by the Nazis. And so there was like a pause button. So even though uh, Vietnam was colonized by the French, they're going to pause sort of their influence while they are trying to repulse uh, the Nazis. Uh, once uh, sort of the French government is reestablished, uh, they want to also reestablish their connection, their ties to their colonies throughout the world, including Vietnam. And so they come back into Vietnam and they're like, hey, even though we hit the pause button, we are still uh, your colonial powers, overseers that are over you. Uh, we're going to come back and sort of influence your politics and government again and, and have influence uh, in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So, but what is what was happening before World War II and during World War II and after World War II is the Vietnamese people led by Ho Chi Minh, he's pictured right here, uh, were valuing their independence from France. They wanted to be an independent country. And actually Ho Chi Minh at the conclusion of World War I shows up in France during the Treaty of Versailles and, and is just kind of going around to various countries and trying to gain support for independence movement from France. And he becomes educated in France. He lives in France for a period of time. Uh, uh, but he really uses that education to sort of catalyze and get inspired to spark an independence movement uh, for Vietnam to be free of French uh, colonial power. So, but here's France after World War II is over. They're like, oh, we're coming back, Vietnam. So get ready. Well, Ho Chi Minh and others uh, are going to decide that they are going to overthrow. So after World War II is over, they launch a liberation movement uh, to overthrow France. And it's going to be about a nine-year battle. Um, France is going to send troops and military uh, to go resist Ho Chi Minh and his followers. Uh, and they're going to fight that war all the way up until 1954 and the, until the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and when the French military is pretty much humiliated and they leave. So, the, and then the currents that are following Ho Chi Minh, uh, he was a communist, but he's kind of a loose communist. Again, he was going around to countries being like, hey, support me in my independence movement. He actually came to America and he was very, uh, sort of, he loved the Declaration of Independence and our independence movement against Great Britain. He loved President Wilson and actually sought sort of to have a, a conference and a talk with uh, Woodrow Wilson, which he didn't end up having. Wilson didn't agree to meet with him. And so historians are just like, what could have happened if Wilson met with them and sort of encouraged France to stop uh, being a colonial power over Vietnam? Would we have had the Vietnam conflict? But anyways, uh, history continues. And and so Ho Chi Minh is a communist and sort of that fabric after World War II is now we are fighting communism, both the Soviet Union and then the spread of communism abroad. And so as France is fighting Ho Chi Minh, this communist, we want to support that effort. So we are giving money and materials and weapons to France to aid them in this fight against this liberation movement for independence of Vietnam from France. So really, it could have been easy for us to support Ho Chi Minh, except that he was communist. That became the big divider for us when really we 
want him to have independence and freedom. We're a country that values those things. But since he was communist, we drew a hard line there. And that is what is going to set forward America's course into a war eventually with Ho Chi Minh and his followers in the Vietnam conflict and the Vietnam War. So you see by the end of 1954, we are paying pretty much 75% of the French war cost against Ho Chi Minh just because he is communist. So by the time that the French went out of Vietnam in 1954, they lost this big battle against the Vietnamese military, uh, this revolutionary movement. France wants out. So they meet with Vietnam's leaders uh, in uh, Geneva, in uh, Switzerland. And they ended up agreeing on, let's divide Vietnam at the 17th parallel, kind of like Korea is the 38th. Well, Vietnam is... Uh, in the tropical area, so in the southern hemisphere, well, the 17th parallel is what divides North Vietnam from South Vietnam. And it was decided that Ho Chi Minh and the communists are going to control the north with their capital at Hanoi. Uh, and again, they're saying that they're not necessarily communists, but they are friends with the Soviet Union because and China, because they're these countries that have been helping Ho Chi Minh to fight against the French. Um, and so in the south, the South is going to be a capitalist democratic government under a man named Go Dinh Diem, uh, who's essentially a very uh, weak leader. He doesn't have a lot of support from Southern Vietnamese. He's Catholic, which is a religious minority, and he's going to be pretty harsh in how he treats uh, his people in South Vietnam. So, but of course, because he's capitalistic democratic, uh, we are going to want to support him against what appears to be a communist North Vietnam. And so after a period of time, they're going to call for free elections and then unite the country under DM in the South or under uh, Ho Chi Minh in the North. But it's going to be on that election that's going to decide sort of who's going to be the leader that the country is going to be under. OK, well, DM, seeing that he's not very popular, even in South Vietnam, is not going to be very popular in North Vietnam because he's not this guy that for decades has been leading this independent movement against France. And so Diem's like, I'm not going to hold an election because I know I'm going to lose. OK, and so once he does that, then in South Vietnam, there becomes a new organization that is trying to get rid of Diem and uh, sort of continue in this independence movement. And that organization is called the National Liberation Front. It's later known as the Viet Cong. So when American soldiers mention the Viet Cong, they are mentioning the South Vietnamese that are trying to liberate South Vietnam from Diem and eventually from America and uh, the, the colonial uh, sort of powers that could be there. So uh, Eisenhower's, here he is in this picture, he's supporting Diem. And eventually when Eisenhower is done with his two terms as president in the 1950s, Kennedy gets elected. And again, he doesn't want to look like he's weak on communism, Kennedy, so he sends advisors. Uh, in 1961 to help DM stay in power, even though this National Liberation Front and many of the South Vietnamese citizens are really upset at DM. So we don't want DM to leave because then it is going to look like North Vietnam and South Vietnam will be unified under Ho Chi Minh. Okay, so our first American death that happens in Vietnam is actually in 1957 when we have troops there, but we're not calling them troops because we're not at war. We're not in a war there. We just call them advisors. Okay, and so as uh, DM is in power. He's not making any changes. Now he's being propped up by America and he continues kind of ruthless, heavy handed tactics. He's kind of uh, more like a dictator, less like a democratic leader. Uh, and so a lot of the South Vietnamese are really going to abhor and hate him uh, to the extent where two Buddhist monks are going to go into, the uh, into a busy street in Saigon, which is the capital city of South Vietnam, and literally light themselves on fire to protest against DM. And they both die. But here's the picture, a very famous picture uh, in world history, American history. You see this monk is just meditating as he's burning alive and burning to death. So the public, American public sees this reaction to DM and is outraged. We are supporting this guy with American military troops, their advisors, with money, with weapons against the Viet Cong, against the North Vietnamese as well. And he's treating his own people so badly that they're literally they're going into streets and lighting themselves on fire. And so uh, Kennedy and CIA decide that, hey, we need to get rid of DM. Yeah, he is a bad fella, a bad mamma jamma, a bad leader. So let's get rid of him. So the U.S. backs a coup that ends up killing DM and then his brother, 
So our, now we got major blood on our hands. We are firmly involved in South Vietnam. And so things are just gonna escalate and get worse and worse and worse from 1963 on from there. So, but while Kennedy's president, Again, he's going to be assassinated in 1963, but from his first year as president, there's going to be 700 troops. Again, we're calling them advisors because we're not actively in a war in Vietnam at this point uh, in a conflict. And by 1963, he's stationed now 16,000 more troops, again, to protect DM and his sort of uh, uh, politicians to protect uh, the military that's there against this liberation movement uh, from North Vietnam and members of South Vietnam as well. Okay, so we are getting firmly entrenched there, uh, and we're only going to come more so as we go forward. So this will be the start of my next le lecture. Why is the U.S. so interested in Vietnam? Why do we even care what's going on in Southeast Asia? Uh, and just kind of with the Korean War, uh, we're going to want to be involved in Korea to stop the spread of communism. Pretty much the same thing is going to happen in Vietnam, but fast forward about 10, 15 years uh, in American history and in time. So, but this will be the start of our next lecture. So this was nice and brief, right? Only 15 uh, minutes. And so a good introduction, hopefully to the Vietnam War for you. So look for the next lecture. This will come uh, next time. So this is the first of three. All right, see you guys.